for a clarification, I am a Roman Catholic theologian and I work in a department or a faculty for Roman Catholic theology in Münster University in uh, Germany. And I see my colleague uh, Pavlo Smitsnyuk here, whom I want to congratulate because according to the old calendar today is St. Peter and Paul, so it's your name day today. For the best, maybe say if there are other Peters and Pauls, the congratulation relates to everybody who is who is named Peter. Or thank you, Paul. thank you, Thomas, and thank you for being with us. Thank you for having me, for inviting me. I will give my presentation in three parts. First of all, I will simply speak about the factual events after the recognition of autocephaly of the Orthodox Church of Ukraine. Then I will talk a little bit about the circumstances which um, uh, under which the events took place. And my third part will just naming a couple of points of interest in connection with these events and with these uh, developments. And I hope we will have enough time for discussion afterwards, so I will not use all, all the time uh, of this slot. Uh, I have many, uh, two, two more remarks. One is I have a lot of um, uh, bad characteristics, and one of them is that I speak too fast, too quickly. So if I do, please, interrupt me and say stop stop slower and so on. No? I, I have the habit in becoming faster and faster and, and I understand it's not good but it's a matter of fact. The second is I saw because I have an artificial background sometimes as you can see now my shoulder disappears but I can assure you I have two shoulders and everything is okay with me so don't don't worry if you see only one one part of me. Okay and I have prepared a short presentation. Um, which should be this here, yes. Okay. Um, so first point, as I said, the first section is about the factual events. You know, probably I understood that the Orthodox Church of um, Ukraine was recognized in the turn of 2018-2019. But this process was already prepared already earlier. And I understand you had a lecture by Nikolas Denisenko, who will have told, who has told you most probably said there is almost a hundred years um, history of the idea of autocephaly of an Ukrainian Orthodox Church. But the events about which we talk right now is a, a thing of the last four or five years or so. And you probably, uh, what should I do now? Yes, you probably also heard that in January 2019, the ecumenical EP, the ecumenical patriarchate, granted autocephaly to the Orthodox Church of Ukraine, the so-called Thomas. So the deed, the document, was signed by the ecumenical patriarch on January 5th in 2019, and it was given to the head of the new church, Metropolitan Epiphany, on the next day on January 6th. That means in these days, 5th and 6th of January 2019, the official recognition of the independence of the autocephaly of the um, Orthodox Church of Ukraine took place. I'm speaking not today about, as you understood, about the inner events within uh, Ukrainian Orthodoxy, but about world Orthodoxy. So the next most important thing was in October uh, 2019, 12th of October, when the Church of Greece, the, the uh, autocephalous uh, Church of Hellas, recognized the Orthodox Church of Ukraine. The next is a couple of weeks later, the Patriarchate of Alexandria, one of the four ancient patriarchates, uh, recognizes the or recognized the Orthodox Church of Ukraine. Then in January 2020, a meeting took place in Amman in Jordan, which was hosted by the Patriarchate of Jerusalem. The Patriarch and the Patriarchate of Jerusalem wanted to like intermediate and to, to facilitate between <coughs> the, the um, uh, churches, the Orthodox churches, which are not in, were not and are still are not in communion anymore. Um, but it was in so far not a success as uh, especially representatives of the churches which had acknowledged and recognized the Orthodox Church of Ukraine did not show up. Uh, the other churches were represented, but it did not change uh, anything. And it even had led to a certain tension between the patriarchates of Jerusalem 
and of uh, Constantinople. In fall 2020, that was a little bit of a process, but let's say in November, the Church of Cyprus recognized the Orthodox Church uh, of Ukraine. So until now, we have, we, of course, we have the Ecumenical Patriarchate and we have the three churches, Greece, uh, uh, Alexandria and Cyprus, which have recognized the Orthodox Church of Ukraine, which means that the first hierarch, so the Archbishop of Athens, the Patriarch of Alexandria, and the Archbishop of uh, um, uh, Cyprus, when they uh, celebrate liturgy, they name all the first hierarchs of the church with whom their church is in communion, and they add and of course the ecumenical patriarch does the same, they add metropolitan um, Epiphany as one of the first hi hierarchs um, in the church. That is the, the formal, so to say, expression of how churches are in communion uh, with uh, each other. And of course the churches which did not um, uh, recognize the Orthodox Church of Ukraine by now, the Romanian Serbian Church and so on, simply do not mention him. And the interesting thing is also what, what we should keep in mind for a normal bishop or a normal priest, there's almost no um, difference because the bishops do not, nom uh, do, do not commemorate uh, the first hierarchs of the other churches. Um, okay. In every case of the four K or of, let's say of the three cases mentioned, we had a dispute within the respective church. So, when there was a debate whether the church should recognize the Orthodox Church of Ukraine or not, there was, also, uh, there was always a debate within the respective Orthodox Church. It was never done uh, unanimously and without problems. So it always was more or less a kind of a conflict. You can see in the case of Cyprus, it, it lasted even a certain time because they, they took the, it needed the time to, to come to a, uh, to a solution. In Alexandria and the Church Patriarchate of, oh no, first maybe, um, there was a larger share of bishops within the Church of Greece, which protested and partly did not accept the autocephaly even until now. As I said before, it doesn't have any concrete um, uh, consequences. The form, say, celebrate liturgy, that did not change at all. And of course, the Archbishop of Athens continues to commemorate uh, metropolitan Epiphany, but they are still unhappy. Some of them are still unhappy with this uh, situation. In Alexandria, also some of the bishops protested. And it was interesting that the Patriarch of Alexandria himself expressed his sorrow about the decision. He was, he said that he was in very good relations with Metropolitan Onufri, who is the head of the Ukrainian Orthodox Church and said he was very sorry about that and so on. So he, he expressed his personal sorrow, sorrow about the uh, situation, but nevertheless, the church uh, recognized the Orthodox Church of Ukraine. And in Cyprus, there was a real debate, an intensive debate. Cyprus is a very small church with some 10 or 12 or so bishops, and it came almost to a split of the, of the local church. There was also criticism from the side of well-known Orthodox theologians and church leaders, most prominently probably Archbishop Anastasios of Albania. He's a very renowned and, and well-recognized um, uh, theologian and church leader. And uh, he wrote a letter to the Ecumenical Patriarchate, uh, Patriarch in which he expressed his, uh, that he was not satisfied with the, with the pro procedure. What did the Russian Orthodox Church do? do in each case say the words the relations with that church. That means that the Russian patriarch did not mention when he celebrates and does until today, when he celebrates liturgy, he does not mention the ecumenical patriarch, uh, patriarch the patriarch of uh, Alexandria, the archbishop of Cyprus and the archbishop of Greece. He simply dropped them from the so-called diptychs, that is the list of first hierarchs, which shows that they are in communion. And the Russian Orthodox Church told their clerics, bishops and priests that they must not concelebrate with clerics from these churches, from these four churches. And they told their believers that they are not allowed to um, go to this, to receive the sacraments in one of these uh, churches. 
Um, it's very interesting that there is a special case in the Church of Greece, maybe because it was the first church after the Ecumenical Patriarchate, which recognized the Orthodox Church of Ukraine, because the Russian Orthodox Church followed and registered very thoroughly which bishops, which Greek bishops voted for the recognition of the Orthodox Church of Ukraine and which bishops voted against it. There's even, you can find on the website of the Russian Orthodox Church, a list in the internet, a list with dioceses of the, Greek, of the Church of Greece, the bishops of which did not recognize the Orthodox Church of Ukraine. The Russian Orthodox Church recommends to organize pilgrimages to these dioceses, but not to the other ones. So obviously say, try or say see a split and or try maybe even to, to, to make the split deeper within the Church of Greece by saying, okay, we are in good relations with these dioceses because the bishops did not accept the um, uh, recognition of the OCU and the other ones, we are not in communion with them. There were single cases when bishops of another church concelebrated with representatives of the Orthodox Church of Ukraine or were, where single bishops commemorated Metropolitan Epiphany, the head of the OCU. However, that, connect, that cannot be taken as a formal recognition. In these cases, there have been, for example, there was a case about the uh, church in uh, the Czech lands in Slovakia. In these cases, there has been no confirmation by the highest bodies of these churches. And these acts, single acts, which did um, happen, do not change the global situation. And in all, the question of concelebration shows a very interesting and somehow a very strange phenomenon. Um, because we do not have a strict observance of church communion in the sense in which I just tried to present it. I will give you an example. Before the Church of Cyprus in 2019, before the Church of, Cy of Cyprus recognized the Orthodox Church of Ukraine, one of the bishops from Cyprus went to Constantinople for the Feast of St. Andrew in 2019. There in Constantinople was also a bishop from the OCU and they all concelebrated with the Patriarch. And that shows a tricky constellation because Constantinople is in communion with the OCU and with Cyprus. But at this moment, 2019, the both churches were not in communion. And that is still the case in many churches. So as we can see, and that is something which has been very frequently throughout history, churches and their representatives, the bishops, do not always behave logically. You have this case that we have it right now, that churches are in communion with, one church is in communion with two churches, but they are not in communion among themselves. This whole situation somehow shows how the Orthodox Church does not have mechanisms and procedures how to regulate the relations between the single churches. Above all are questions like the one of the um, canonical territory or of how to grant autocephaly. This brings along many problems and I would like to address some of them. My first point would be a question about um, decision making in, times, in a time of crisis. We all know it's well known that the churches of Constantinople and of Russia have been in a larger crisis for many years already, not only since 2018 and not only since 2016. There have been arguments over several points and issues, but in the end, it's always about the competences of the first C. So that means the competences of the Patriarchate of Constantinople. The Russian Orthodox Church does not deny at all that Constantinople is the first church in the canonical order. However, the question, I'm sorry, I have, yes, that's what I'm here. And it's about, I said, the role of the Patriarch of Constantinople. Um, the question is, what does it mean to be the first in the canonical order? The Russian Orthodox Church speaks frequently about a primacy of honor, which would not imply any juridical consequences. It is just that the Patriarch of Constantinople, according to the Russians, or his representative has the right to preside over meetings and liturgies, to convene synods and meetings, but in agreement with the other first hierarchs of the Orthodox churches. So it's the, as you call it, the, 
primus inter pares, the first among equals. But according to this standpoint of the Russian Orthodox Church, the Patriarch of Constantinople is not allowed to make decisions by his own. The Patriarchate of Constantinople, on the other side, claims that it has far broader rights. In any case, these debates are not new at all, but they reflect the fact that the Orthodox Church has not yet found a way to come to decisions in questions of church organization in modernity, in our modern times. It's interesting there is no or almost no problem um, in questions of doctrine. All the local churches completely agree in the basic issues. But the last binding decision on doctrinal issues was made in the eighth century. And of course, the world has changed since then. I will give you an example. We have the famous, uh, I guess you have heard about this, the, can the famous ca uh, Canon 28 of the Council of Chalcedon, Council in the year 451. And this uh, canon underlines the right of the ecumenical patriarch to have jurisdictions, jurisdiction in areas with no Orthodox Church. I would like to have a look with you at the text. So said, it says, the canon says, so said in the Pontics, the Asian and the Thracian dioceses, which means here not church dioceses, but provinces of the Roman Empire, the metropolitans only, and such bishops also of the dioceses aforesaid, as are among the barbarians, should be ordained by the aforesaid most holy throne of the most holy church of Constantinople. Every metropolitan of the aforesaid dioceses, together with the bishops of his province, ordaining his own provincial bishops. So it says the, the patriarch of Constantinople ordains the metropolitans in Pontic, Asian, and, and Thracian dioceses. And the metropolitan himself ordains his bishops. So not every bishop is ordained by the patriarch, but only the metropolitans. And also th such bishops as are among the barbarians should be ordained by the church of Constantinople. So the ones in the mentioned, the three mentioned provinces and the ones who are among the barbarians, meaning who do not belong to the Roman empire. That is the base by which the Patriarchate of Constantinople says we are responsible for the church in places where there is no uh, proper Orthodox church. And now, of course, we can, uh, well, we have actually, we have to ask ourselves what does that mean in the 21st century? So, for example, here where I'm right now in Germany, is that among the barbarians, uh, according to the interpretation of Constantinople, one would say yes. Uh, but of course, it is very difficult to organize a church in the 21st century with the ideas uh, and the terminology of the 5th uh, century. Um, okay, as that we had. The next is, yes, um, you have probably heard that for resolving such problems like the jurisdictions, the Orthodox Church had initiated a process of convening a pan-Orthodox council in the 20th century. The process was, sorry, the process uh, was yeah, started by the Ecumenical Patriarchate and it lasted almost one century. Of topics which should be addressed. This list was reduced step by step in many preliminary meetings and it was decided not to discuss any topic which a consensus could not be reached. When the council convened finally in 2016, only six topics were discussed and respective documents were accepted. The list of topics was around 100 topics. Among the issues, the topics which did not make it to the council, since the first hierarchs could not agree on them, was the text on how to gain autocephaly. The churches wanted, the Orthodox churches wanted to find a consensus on this question, but they did not succeed. That means that the ecumenical patriarch knew that there was no consensus on how to achieve autocephaly when he granted it to the Orthodox Church of Ukraine. He acted according to what he thought was right. However, he must have been aware that other churches did not see it the same way. 
it's not my task. It's beyond the topic of this lecture, of course, to, to uh, discuss the question, what's the correct process for autocephaly is. Obviously, there are arguments on both sides. But what is important here, it seems to me, is the fact that the ecumenical patriarchate had to expect that the Russian Orthodox Church would not accept the decision. And other churches, until now still many of them, did not follow the path of the ecumenical patriarchate. This division uh, uh, within orthodoxy is not about national belonging. It's not like Greek churches against Slavic churches, as it is fre frequently put. But it is about the interpretation of a canonical situation. So it is very clear in the reaction of Archbishop Anastasios of Albania, whom I mentioned before. Another very interesting case is the Church of Serbia. One could argue Serbia has somehow similar problems with autocephaly because you have Northern Macedonia and you have even Montenegro where there are other churches and the Serbian Orthodox Church claims uh, jurisdiction. Um, uh, you could say it's as a, sl a Slavic like uh, a link between the Russian church and the Serbian church. But traditionally, one has to see traditionally, the Serbian church always had very good relations with the Patriarchate of Constantinople and in general with the Greek speaking churches. Most of the bishops of the Serbian church speak Greek and have studied in Greece. And it seems to be that the reaction of the Serbian church in this case is on the ground of a different interpretation of the canons. So in other words, what I want to, to say, when one makes a decision in a situation which concerns, which concerns also others who do not accept that you are entitled to this decision, then you must expect problems. And that is what happened. The ecumenical patriarchate insists that it acted correctly and that the others have to accept their decision. But that does not help, of course, and it will not change the situation. A second, a next point, a second main point is the question about church borders. Historically, church borders have mostly been erected along political borderlines. In antiquity, patriarchates and metropolitanates reflected the borders of the provinces in the Roman Empire. You, you remember in the canon, it speaks, they speak about di dioceses in provinces of the Roman Empire. Said, can in modernity and in modernity autocephaly is uh, frequently linked to the borders of a modern state and that can cause problems because in case if that happens that borders change especially when states split as it was the, the case with Czechoslovakia with the Soviet Union or with Yugoslavia the church somehow makes itself depending from the state on the other hand, there is a nation. Many, though so not all, but many Orthodox churches understand themselves as a nation church and they see their responsibility for the members of the same nation. That can also lead to tensions, for example, when Orthodox believers of a given nation live on the territory of another church. For example, there are Serbs who live in Romania and there are Romanians who live in Serbia. Which Orthodox Church is responsible for them? For whom? Is it about territory or is it about people? Is it about the nation? As mentioned earlier, that becomes especially important in the case of diasporas, of territories where the Orthodox are a tiny minority. Here in Germany, where I live, is a, Germany is a good example. We have in Germany around a dozen Orthodox bishops who all claim that they have the jurisdiction over all Germany. They want, in order to show that they are not in competition, but they are, that they are one church, they formed a bishop's conference. Since the schism between the ecumenical patriarchate and the Russian Orthodox Church, the three Russian bishops who are here in Germany do not take part anymore in the work conference. And that has massive consequences. The Bishops' Conference here in Germany, the Orthodox Bishops' Conference, is in charge for all kinds of agreements with the state authorities. For example, we do have in Germany, we teach religion in all public schools as a compulsory discipline for members of a given religious community. But all the agreements which were made or have to be made in connection with that now do not represent anymore the majority of the Orthodox in the country. 
because the Russians do not take pay, uh, part in, in in the work of the committee of the committee and of the of the conference, but they form a large share of the Orthodox in Germany. There's also, for example, an issue of religious program on TV. Twice a year, a liturgy is broadcasted on Sunday morning, one on the Sunday of Orthodoxy, when all the bishops can celebrate it, and that is not possible anymore. So what I want to say is here it is not so much about new coalitions or alliances, but rather about very practical issues. When churches live together, they have to fulfill their mission also somehow together. One of the Russian bishops in Germany proposed an informal meeting. And as far as I heard, they succeeded in creating an informal work group, working group, which would enable the Orthodox Church in this country to function in some fields of basic interest. Another issue, which does not only relate to Germany, is the ecumenical relations between the Orthodox Church and other churches. Usually the dialogue committees are composed by representatives of all Orthodox churches and a bishop from the ecumenical patriarchate chairs, chairs the committee. The Russians will not take and do not take part in, in such committees anymore as long as the schism will exist. That means that all these dialogues have come to a standstill or that they are in fact not full dialogues as not all of the Orthodox world is represented in them. But it's important to, to see and to underline that it does not mean that the Russian Orthodox Church has um, dropped out completely from all ecumenical endeavors. They do it similarly to the Roman Catholic Church. They prefer bilateral dialogues, which they continue to entertain. Uh, a last, no, it's not the last, but last but one, I think, point is the question about the principle of autocephaly, how I'm with time. Okay, the debate, uh, we are talking about the debate within, autos, within orthodoxy is about autocephaly, concretely for the Orthodox Church, Church in Ukraine. The principle of autocephaly brings along a variety of problems. We have today, I think I have now two, yes, uh, yes, we have today 15 autocephalous churches. 14 of them are undisputed. And the OCU and the OCA, the Orthodox Church in America, are recognized only by some of them. So you see in the first group, autocephalous churches, these are the ones which everybody recognizes, but um, the church in the third group, canonical churches, I call it with disputed status, you have the church in Northern America, OCA, Orthodox Church in America, and the Orthodox Church of Ukraine, which are recognized by some, but not by all Orthodox churches. In addition, you have autonomous churches, which have a, a, a lesser degree of independence, like the monastery in Sinai, the Church of Finland, Church of Japan, and others. And you have uncanonical churches, meaning churches which are not recognized by anybody, which is the Orthodox Church in Northern Macedonia, in Montenegro, and some others. And until, until 28, the Kiev Patriarchate and the Autocephalous Church in Ukraine. Uh, autocephaly means that a church can choose its own head and that election has not to be accepted or recognized by anyone. So in the moment someone is elected as a patriarch or as the archbishop of an autocephalous church, at that moment he is a patriarch. There's no one who has to confirm it. We have, but when we look, uh, when we take a closer look, we will see that we have different types of autocephaly. Some of them were never granted. The first line, Patriarchates of Constantinople, Alexandria, Antioch, Jerusalem, there's no document, no Thomas, they were never given autocephaly, but they emerged in, antiqu in antiquity in parallel to the emergence of church structures in general. The Russian Orthodox Church is a special case. Since it was given, the autocephaly was given to Russia in the 16th century with the consensus of the ancient patriarchates. And all other, patri uh, no, all other autocephalies, which we have here on the list in the first section, uh, emerged in the 19th and 20th century. It is interesting that the ecumenical patriarchate makes the differentiation on its website. When you look for the Orthodox churches on the website of the ecumenical patriarchate, 
you will find three categories, the so-called old patriarchates, newer patriarchates, and autocephalous churches. These are the three uh, categories. So say even recognize, and it's historically, of, co of course, it's true and clear, that there are like older and newer churches. It's interesting in fact of, or in, in terms of being a church, there's no difference. Even a very small church like the one in Poland or in Slovakia and the Czech countries has in a meeting the same weight and, and the same possibility to vote for or against the question as very old and very large churches, Constantinople, Russia, Alexandria, Antioch, and, and so on. The list you see here is about the churches as they exist today. In history, he, there have been other churches, autocephalous churches, which do not exist anymore or which exist in a different form. The church, for example, of Ochrid or Achrida is an example. It was an autocephalous church from the 10th until the 18th century. The place Ochrid is today a city in northern Macedonia, but the tradition of the Ochrid church is claimed by several other churches, by Serbia, by Bulgaria, by, by northern Macedonia. And a little bit of different additional topic is autocephalies which did exist, were extinct, did not exist for a time and re-emerged again. So it shows somehow that history does not happen in a in a straight line. The Church of Kiev is a good example. Today, at least four bishops claim to be the Metropolitan or the Patriarch of Kiev, and each of them has a certain point. They all relate to the Christianization of Kiev in the 10th century. That shows very clearly that historical arguments can be found for almost every position, and that therefore they can never be convincing. History can serve as a justification, but never as an evidence. I, want, I would like to add that from a theological point of view, one could argue that autocephaly is a secondary category. The local church, theologically, ecclesiologically, the local church is the diocese or the eparchy headed by a bishop. Many people experience the parish as the local church. Local church is where I go every Sunday. That is my local church. Huh? Um, that is where people encounter regularly the church. But the autocephalous church, similarly to the bishops' conferences in the Western church, is a level between the local church and the universal church. And it's interesting that an institution which is ecclesiologically weakly founded has become so important in ecclesial life. In all cases of granting autocephalies, the political factor has played a decisive role and it continues to do until today. This is also an indication for its weak theological foundation. Because political circumstances changed over the centuries, the autocephalies have very different shapes today. Some of them compri comprise vast territories, like the Patriarchate of Alexandria, for example. Alexandria has the jurisdiction over all the continent of Africa. So many, many countries, many different cultures, everything in the Patriarchate of, of Alexandria. And you just have to mention or to think of Alexandria, of the Patriarchate of Alexandria, when somebody, uh, if somebody says orthodoxy is always national churches, Alexandria clearly is not a national church. Others have territories with just one state, sometimes a relatively small state, for example, the Church of Albania. And some have a few states or a few countries like the Serbian Patriarchate or the Church with Serbian Patriarchate claims uh, jurisdiction over seven countries today and the Church of the Czech lands and Slovakia, as the name says, two countries, Czech Republic and Slovakia. Autocephalous churches also differ in other elements. Some of them are patriarchates, others are led by an archbishop or by a metropolitan. Some of them have the right to, react, to erect dioceses in other regions than the ones where they are located. Others do not have that right. That creates a large problem, as I mentioned already, in the diaspora where you have several bishops responsible for the same territory. It was interesting when the council in, in 2016, the um, Holy and Great Council of the Orthodox Church in Crete took place. On the list of participants, there were four bishops, theoretically, there were three, in fact, 
for if the Russians would have come, bishops with the title Bishop of uh -huh, and all Germany. You know? So you have four bishops who are in communion to each other and who are not in competition, but who are bishops of all Germany. And if you are an Orthodox here in Germany, um, you are like, if I would be a Greek in Germany, the Metropolitan in Bonn would be my bishop and my neighbor living in the same place who is Bulgarian or Serbian or Romanian would have another bishop. So it's not about in the diaspora, about territory, but about national belonging. Because of all these reasons, there's no clear notion of autocephaly. The term can mean many different things and it is um, necessary to define what is meant in each case. I come back to this list and I would like to discuss, coming slowly to the end, the last point. That is the question whether we can speak about a schism in orthodoxy. It is a very strange situation. Moscow has interrupted communion with the four churches which recognize the Orthodox Church of Ukraine. They, however, did not and they still commemorate the Moscow Patriarchate. All of these churches commemorate the Moscow Patriarchate. The first hierarchs do that. <clears throat> As also does Metropolitan Epiphany of the Orthodox Church of, of Ukraine. There was a well known Greek bishop who said publicly that the Ecumenical Patriarch is still in communion with Metropolitan Onufri, the head of the Ukrainian Orthodox Church, since he, the Ecumenical Patriarch, commemorates Patriarch Kirill, who is in communion with him, with Onufri. If, as I mentioned earlier, all the bishops, not all the bishops in the churches which recognize the OCU did accept that act. However, as I said already, it has no consequences because only the first hierarch commemorates the other first hierarchs. In any case, there is no strict logic. I mention this fact since it points, since it points to the question of coalitions and alliances, which is in the title of my presentation. There are coalitions and alliances, of course, but they do not follow a strict line of logics. In many cases, they are dependent from coincidences. I would argue that we said what we have right now is the split within orthodoxy. But as frequently in history, it is not so clear who is on which side and why. The reality is much more complicated. By the way, this is valid also for the faithful and for the priests, not only for the bishops. In all cases of splits, which we have today in Ukraine and Moldova and Estonia and in others, we have people who attend both churches, which are officially not in communion, and priests who openly or not so openly can celebrate with priests from the other denomination. Schism is a word which we use to describe a reality, but we must be aware that in church history, that reality was frequently not given, or at least it took time. So one could say that schism is not an event, but more like a, a process. I will come to my conclusion. What does that mean for the situation? We have, I can, I think I am, yes, so I can stop the presentation. Um, we have two rivals, the Ecumenical Patriarchate and the Russian Orthodox Church on different sides. That's very obvious. A small group of churches joined the Ecumenical Patriarchate by recognizing the Orthodox Church of Ukraine. Another small group, Serbia, Poland, Georgia, and perhaps some others, joined the Russian Orthodox Church by now verbally. But the largest group of churches stays undecided. It seems to me that this could be an advantage. If say all, if all the Orthodox churches would join a side, one side, we would have a real and a deep split in Orthodoxy. The churches which are in communion with Constantinople and with Moscow are the one which can are the ones which can contribute to a resolution of the situation. It is not clear now, it, no, it is not clear how they con can contribute, but as long as the communion is not fully broken, there is more hope that it can be restored. But as we can see, the new coalitions do not follow the lines which one could expect. This is a broad range of opinions and standpoints almost within every church. Churches act and react in given contexts according to their needs and to the respective situation. 
Is it true? It, it is true that we do have two main positions, but there also there are also many smaller ones. I think that can give us hope in so far as it would be wrong to speak about two front lines which are stable and which stand in confrontation with, with each other. I told you in the beginning, I'm a Roman uh, Catholic theologian. And as such, I have, as you say in English, as an English expression, I have no pony in this race. So it doesn't concern me personally, so to say. But for the Roman Catholic Church, as for any other church and for any Christian, I would say, it should be an imper imperative that we hope and pray that other churches do not split and that divisions be healed. The split in orthodoxy is a reason for sorrow and for sympathy with the orthodox, and perhaps also a warning for us Catholics. We think that the unity of our own church, the Catholic church, is very clear, but in fact it is not. But that is already a different issue, which I'm not going to talk about today. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Professor Bremer, for uh, interesting lecture. And uh, uh, I start our discussion uh, for all the students. The issue of the creating uh, of the Orthodox Church of Ukraine is not new one. You had uh, on the previous lectures uh, about uh, the processes happening in Ukraine and around Ukraine. So uh, I'm sure you have a lot of questions to our professor. Please raise your hand or switch on your microphones. Yeah. Meanwhile, the students are preparing their own questions. They have uh, also a question uh, to you because uh, you mentioned a lot of uh, uh, problems of recognizing uh, the Orthodox Church of Ukraine. And because it was one side decision of Patriarch of Constantinople, uh, but uh, uh, what I'm missing in your presentation is the position of the Russian Orthodox Church because the influence by the other Orthodox Church are not recognizing them. It's not only a theological reason, and for, but mostly it was like a financial reason or the pressure, political pressure from Moscow. Uh, to what extension it could be true? For example, in the, you know, in the Church of Greece, it was like the official appeal uh, to the Russian Federation uh, against their pressure on their bishops uh, from the side of Moscow uh, in order not to recognize the uh, Orthodox Church of Ukraine. So uh, when we speak about theological uh, 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 about the theological issues, it also we have many like a political or geopolitical uh, directions it doesn't allow to uh, the Orthodox Church of Ukraine to be recognized. What do you think about this? Thank you. Oh, it's a difficult and a sad issue. I mean, uh, first of all, I was, when you said uh, there was a lot of financial influence, my first question was, how do you know? Uh, uh, you read newspaper and you, you listen from journalists, but we don't see these, these uh, flows. And for example, the, the, I heard about, I know of course that the, there was an issue in the Church of, of Greece, but the Church of Greece did recognize the OCU. And for example, where I know people a little bit better, for example, I'm, I'm quite, I think I'm familiar with the events and with the developments in the Serbian Orthodox Church. Of course, Serbia is in a special situation and the Russians, the Russian state has a special interest in Serbia and so on, and, and church issues play, uh, play a role. But the, the bishops I know and the people with whom I, the theologians with whom I speak, for them, uh, uh, it is indeed uh, something else. It's it's not not this pressure. So I understand it exists, but I'm and, but I'm not an economist, but I'm a I'm a theologian. So I'm more interested in the theological reasons. And I think, um, um, according to to I mean, if you say it says a lot of pressure and and there's a lot of money being paid, why? Did, for example, Cyprus, where the Russians have a massive interest and a lot of money, why did they recognize the church? They would be the first to not to recognize the, the OCU. So you must give me a good explanation why these churches did not recognize them and these did recognize them. Um, and I, I, I don't see it. So I, what I want to say, yes, there is influence, but I do not, I, I do not see any evidence that it is successful or that 
the Russian influence is the main is the main point, the main reason for these churches to recognize or to not recognize the new church, the Orthodox Church of Ukraine. I, I, I repeat, I do not doubt at all that the Russians have interest and that the Russian diplomacy massively uh, intervenes, no? but it's not successful. Pavlo, uh, you raised your, your hand. Uh, yes, thank you, uh, Thomas, for this uh, very interesting lecture. I have uh, a question. You turned okay, off can you hear me now? Yes, yeah. I'm sorry. Uh, what are the lessons that we can learn from what has happened for the Catholics and for, for the Orthodox? Like uh, in the Catholic Church, uh, like we have some tensions between various bishop conferences, yes, in the US, in Germany, and perhaps one of the solutions would be to give more freedom to bishop conferences to be independent in, in their decisions. Uh, and I think this idea has been already, uh, perhaps uh, uh, Josef Ratzinger expressed it in the 70s, saying that the Catholic Church might need uh, new patriarchates in Latin America, in Africa, which are very different and perhaps don't fit all together in one. Uh, a centralized structure. So what can Catholics learn from this mess within the Orthodox world? And also the question about the Orthodox. Um, a Ravenna document uh, was probably one of the first times the Orthodox, or at least the, the churches that sent their theologians to a Ravenna meeting, recognized the need of a primacy within the church. Yes, yeah, so they always recognized Rome or Constantinople as primus inter pares, but Ravenna seemed to be like a step toward a, a more robust recognition of the primacy. Today, when Constantinople is criticized by the Russians, by Serbians, by other churches as being perhaps too authoritarian, will it dissuade other Orthodox churches in pursuing this uh, deepening of discovery of the need of primacy to the Orthodox Church, or maybe on the contrary, since there is no way to solve this problem. Yeah, at least nobody can indicate us, okay, in order to solve the problem with uh, Ukraine, you need to do ABC. Will this condition of crisis lead to a, a new uh, rethinking uh, within Orthodoxy about how to deal how to keep the unity between the autocephalous churches. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. It's very funny indeed um, that we have now, I mean, we have all this idea and traditional ideas, the Catholic Church is like monolithic authoritarian and the Orthodox Church is like synodal and so on. And nowadays there's criticism by the Orthodox. The patriarch is too authoritarian and in the Catholic you find criticism, the Pope is not authoritarian enough. Now we are too, the Catholics, we are too uh, synodal and they are too papal, no? so it's, it's somehow absurd. As for your question, uh, what the Orthodox can learn, I'm of course not, not the person to, to, to be a master for the Orthodox and to tell them what they can do, but I will simply quote an Orthodox colleague of mine, whom I invited like when it all started to my class and um, he and we discussed about primacy and synodality and so on and he said well in the given situation we orthodox see that we would need a primate right? how, how good it will would be he's of course he does not speak about infallibility and absolute power and so on but a service the primacy as a service that's the, the traditional expression service to unity no? How that could function, that is another question, but it's interesting that he said we, we now see in this crisis that we don't have uh, someone who, who, who could serve as a, who, who, who could give a service um, uh, to unity. Uh, <clears throat> I think, and I, that's all I want to say of, of what, the, what the Orthodox uh, uh, can learn, so to, so to say. I would mention two, two points in, in answering your question. One is a very simple question, which is, uh, I think not, it looks only simple, but it's much more, it's not banal at all. It's much more complicated. What is unity? 
it's it's not so simple to answer what unity is. Huh? Um, I mean, what means unity in the Catholic Church? You have a, a church of 1.4 billion uh, members, and uh, of course, we're all in union. But if you, as you said, we have these conflicts nowadays, the German, the so-called synodal path and the development here in Germany, which are very strong, many bishops, and you have other bishops in other countries, here in Germany also, but in other countries who are completely against that and who who many, many Catholics, many bishops see us German Catholics in schism already and so on. So somehow, yes, we are all um, uh, in union, in unity, we are all in unity, but but how 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 does how do you see how can you experience that that unity? And it's interesting um, uh, also if you ask what does it mean to be Catholic? Uh, the traditional answer would be to be under the Pope. <clears throat> Sorry, <clears throat> many people nowadays uh, from both wings, so to say, within the Catholic Church would not accept that anymore. And if you look at the Catholic Church, you will see a very very broad range of different opinions. I'm speaking about. I'm speaking not only about the Eastern churches and the Latin church within the Catholic church, but even within the respective churches, you feel, you see a lot of, of, of a different thing. And, and it is not so clear to me to say, I mean, we can easily give a formal answer to be under the Pope, to, to accept the authority of the Pope. But even then you get people nowadays who say, well, the Pope and, and when he gives an interview, it's not true. And, and you can, you can check on websites. I see German websites from, let's say, more conservative Catholics who, who judge the Pope and who said, yes, I read, this. it was very funny, I read someone saying, well, it was last year, there will be an, an encyclical next year. When it comes out, I will check it and see it whether it's Catholic. No? Earlier, the Pope could say what is Catholic, what is not Catholic. Now it goes the other way around and people, people want to check it. So, so it's the question, what is, who is Catholic? What does it mean to be Catholic? What does it mean to be in unity? Is no, not so simple at, at all. And then we have a large problem, which now came to the surface in orthodoxy, because um, if, let me put it again about the Catholic Church. If we were to um, like to sign a, a document, to sign a text, I believe in her, 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 and that is that is Catholic. I think the only text we all could agree on is probably the creed, which we pronounce on Sundays in, in church. Uh, but I think it would be impossible to find a common a platform, a common declaration for Catholics in order to say what is what is Catholic, what all is Catholic, what is what is not Catholic. And since we do not demand from Catholics to 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 sign such a paper we can say, okay, we are in unity. If we would try to define it and to say, you must accept this, 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 then we would have the schism immediately within the Catholic Church. And in the Orthodox Church, we are now at this point where it came to the break because of the situation with Ukraine, of the dif divergent understanding of, of um, uh, the, the competences of the ecumenical patriarchate and the way of how to give autocephaly and so on. And, and now, now you have the point. And that means for me also, I'm, I'm very pessimistic in this regard. I think, as I said in the end, there might be a way if churches like the Romanians, uh, the Serbs and so on, people within these churches who are interested in, in the patriarchates, Antioch, Jerusalem, if they um, uh, could find a way somehow to bring the two sides, the Russians and, and Constantinople, together and to find a way, a procedure to discuss these things. They will not find an easy solution. No? As you said, you, they will not say one, two, three, and that's what you can do and everything will be fine. But maybe they can come to initiate a process of how to come to a solution. If that does not happen, and I'm, I'm quite skeptical about it, if that does not happen, I think, um, especially in the circumstances in modernity in which we live, there will be no way to um, to to come to to union to unity again with an orthodoxy, and I fear that I that we are somehow um, that we are the witnesses of a split of a division of a schism, like in the 11th century or in the 16th century in during the Reformation. So I'm 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 skeptical and pessimistic. I must say I. There's no, because there is no easy way, so to say, to, to, to come to a solution in this question. Maybe so much. I lost you. Are you still? Ah, yes.